Good afternoon. It is indeed an honor to be with the panelists here today. And uh, I hope I can contribute to their extraordinary talent. Um, I have the task of speaking about the United States. Um, United States is not my country of birth, but my country of choice to live and raise a family. So therefore, I feel very entitled to be speaking about the United States today. Um, I want to speak in, I do it in triangles. So first, I want to say that I'm going to talk about the illusion of equality and the reality of inequality in the United States. So we all know, those of you who are here, actually before, before I go any further, can you raise your hands as to how many of you are from the United States? It's the majority, okay. So you already know what I'm going to say. Every woman who works earns average 77 cents to the dollar that a man makes in the United States. All right. However, African American women make 64 cents to the dollar that a man makes. A Latina woman makes 55 cents to the dollar that a man makes. Asian and European American women make anywhere between 80 to 90 cents for the dollar that a man makes. Okay? These are statistics from 2013 of January. All right? Now I'm going to give you the numbers of three CEOs who are women in the Fortune 500 world. Patty Hart is the CEO of International Game Technology. Her annual salary is $6 million. The average annual salary of that industry is $17 million per year. And she took on the job with a minus 65% of that of the man who was leading that organization. Okay? Indra Nuri is the CEO of Pepsi. Her annual salary is 14.2 million. I can't even figure out that number. Okay? And the average industry salary is 11 million. However, she makes 18% less than her male counterpart from whom she took the job. The last one I want to bring up is Denise Morrison. She's the CEO of Campbell Soup. Her salary is 8.7 million a year. Industry average, 11.58 million. She, is 20, she earns 24% less than the man who had that job. Okay, this is our illusional equality. Because most women in the United States believe that we are equal. Believe that we have broken the ranks and actually the younger generation seriously believes we have nothing to worry about. In one sense, there are some things we don't have to worry about. Around education, women are in school, girls are in school. We have more graduate degrees than men in the United States. We are 47% of the workforce and 40% of those women have managerial positions. Okay? So the illusional equality allows us to make ourselves feel pretty comfortable where we are at and really think we are better off than the rest of the world. And therefore, instead of engaging as partners with the rest of the world, we feel sorry for our sisters in Southern Hemisphere. This in itself is very damaging to the United States and those that we, that we try to assist. 
And this I want to, to kind of shift around and say that given these statistics, I'm only talking about one aspect of the United States, right? We are looking at winning strategies and I want to talk about what winning strategies might look like just in this area. And I wanted to break some of the myths that we have. The borders are artificial. That's the first thing I want to talk about, okay? Those are extremely artificial, especially in a time of global economics, okay? Because US domestic and foreign policy is inextricably linked. We cannot go saving the rest of the world if we do not treat half of our humanity within this, the United States, right? That means our foreign policy cannot claim to be saving the women of Afghanistan if we do not know how to pay our own women in the United States. So we have to recognize that domestic and foreign policy in its extremely linked and that the borders are really fluid these days. The other aspect is we talk about gender and this is our own lesson, okay? And we talk about women. And we talk about empowerment and leadership and where women are to come together in our own spaces. It's very true, but we need both. We cannot settle for one. We need to have our own space and we have to integrate ourselves into every aspect of society. Okay? That means that the policy analysis has to go beyond women. It's not just about having women in leadership. It's about every policy that is made has to have an integration of identity, not just gender. Because I just gave you the statistics. African American women make much less and Latina women make less than a Euro Asian or a European American woman. So it's not just about gender, right? So there has to be gender integration and there has to be women empowerment and they have to go hand in hand. The third is around structural and behavioral change. And I want you to now hear these words that I'm going to say. When Letters of recommendation are written in the United States and recommendations are made for women. These are the words most used to talk about women's leadership. Hardworking, a team player, dependable, dedicated. Okay? For men, outstanding, superb, exceptional, brilliant, all right? So this is actually a cognitive error, right? It is a cognitive error. So when we talk about shifting the paradigm, talking about equality, we are not only looking at policy or legislation. We are looking at structural change and behavioral change. They have to go hand in hand. And funders, policymakers, and actually NGOs, those of us working in the field, have separated these two items because we think they operate separately. We think there has to be policy and we have to do a policy strategy and agenda and that behavioral change has to happen differently. And they have to go hand in hand. So based on these, what are the winning strategies? So I'm in a country where my government practices exceptionalism. We think that international law and standards don't apply to us. Hence, we have not ratified the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We are the only industrialized nation not to do so, right? Beijing Platform for Action. We once had an office for women's rights, right, situated in the White House, right? Women's Interagency Council, we don't have one, right? Millennium Development Goals, we don't think apply to us, right? 
frank, if I had the time, I can show you in, with every Millennium Development Goal where US is ranked. But I will, I'll save that for later, right? So we have one win during the last decade. Right? In 19, uh, 2009, President Obama signed the Lilly Lead Bill of Fair Pay Act, right? That changed a civil rights law at the Supreme Court level, right? To say that if women, if a woman is not paid equally and if she's going to sue, she can, uh, uh, the person who makes the decision to pay less can be held accountable from the time that person made that decision, from the time the company made that decision. Am I making sense? I see some frowns. Okay, all right, okay. So that, that is a big win. That is a huge win. That means that actually people can speak up. But it's amazing that there aren't any that many lawsuits coming out of from women, right? There are no class action lawsuits necessarily talking about gender-based discrimination and pay inequity, right? Because we are sort of comfortable. So this is our big win. Besides that, it has been really hard to talk about at the governmental level what has happened. Right? So the good news for us in the United States is we had to take sort of law into our own hands because, you know, the government always thinks that when we talk about human rights, it's about the rest of the world, right? So hence, there are three things that as winning strategies that I wanted to just pinpoint, right? And I'm going to talk about seed or the last, right? One is that because we don't have, we didn't have actually a movement about human rights in the United States, the first organizations post Beijing that got started to do human rights work in the US were started by women of color. There were two in the South, okay? One in Atlanta, one in Mississippi, one in Boston, one in San Francisco, okay? These organizations then later came together and then headed by Wild for Human Rights in San Francisco, we started a US human rights network. At that time we had 12 people doing human rights work in the United States and this was in 1997. Okay. But today there are over 500 organizations looking at the struggles within the United States by using a, a human rights framework. Not only are we doing that, right now over 100 people are at, in Geneva, right, watching the United States talking about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and actually